This story happened to me back when I still lived at my parents' house. I was commuting to college at the time, and had three siblings that also lived at home, my brother and two sisters. For some context, we lived on five acres in rural Ohio, surrounded on both sides by woods and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at 2 a.m., so I had always felt like it was my job to be the man of the house because he was gone during the times when you would imagine something sketchy happening. However, on this night, because it was the weekend, my dad was home. I woke up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to get my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs and coming out of our rooms you could look down over the banister and to see our front door. When I woke up, it took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked at the clock and it was around 2.30 a.m., and my brother told me there were two men at our front door. Now this really woke me up. We quietly walk out of my room and peek over to look down at the front door. When we looked, there was no one at the door, but I noticed my parents off to the side, out of view of the glass on the front door. I whispered down to my dad, and he told me there were two guys who had been talking to each other and knocking on the door. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back into my room and grabbed my pistol quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the door. If they had been, they would have easily seen me coming down the stairs as it is in direct view of the door. My brother is right behind me as we head over to where my parents are, whispering to try and find out what is going on. My parents had awoken to the sound of our dog barking and had come out to find these two men knocking loudly at the door. At this point, the men return and begin knocking again, despite the fact that no one had come to the door and our dog was still actively barking. The fact that they were there at this time, in a location where houses are spread out hundreds of yards, and still knocking with the dog barking, made the situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes the men walked away, and we all shuffled across the kitchen into the family room to peek out the windows into our driveway which is lit up by our outside light. There was a black Cadillac sitting there, but no one was inside from what we could see. Immediately the question was, where did these guys go? They weren't in their car and they were no longer at the front door. Unfortunately we figured out the answer when the handles on our back French doors started jiggling. They were actively trying to enter the back of our house which enters into the kitchen. At this point, I just remember my mom frantically saying, David, to my dad, as pure terror overwhelmed her. Then two things happened, adrenaline filled my body as I prepared my handgun, horrified at the very real possibility that I might have to shoot these men. Secondly, my dad finally grabbed the phone, called the police and calmly told them what was happening. Thankfully, after a minute of jiggling, they stopped at the back door and disappeared again, only to return to their knocking at the front. However, at this point, several minutes had gone by and suddenly we saw the local police fly up in multiple cruisers with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and front yard, the two men bolted away, attempting to run the long way around the house across the driveway. One of them disappeared out of our view, but the other one was intercepted by an officer yelling for him to get on the ground. He didn't and he was immediately tossed, and fell on the ground. Some of the officers went around the house after the other guy and one of them came to talk to my dad and I as we came out the front. They ended up finding the other man hiding in my sister's little playhouse in the backyard. It appears both of them were drunk and or high, as the one who had had cocaine on him. While they were both arrested that night, we never did find out what they were charged with or what happened to them. Needless to say, the whole experience wasn't fun. So, random men at our door in the middle of the night. Let's not meet again. Now this is something I really want to talk about to be sure that everyone is cautious and stays level-headed at all times. Now for context, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Canada. It was an old town that had quite a few abandoned buildings due to absence of residents. Me and many friends were tired of the lack of entertainment options for us, so what we did was explore these abandoned buildings. Prior to the experience I am about to talk about, we never had anything too crazy happen to us. Occasionally we'd see a small bit of blood like liquid and we did see a pentagram on the ground from someone who went to a house previously, but nothing too bad. Until the last time I had gone exploring abandoned buildings. Now when I was younger I used to go to a daycare that was part of a mental hospital. Weird combination I know. It closed down due to a lack of patients and lack of children at the daycare. I decided to go back there with my friends a few years ago. For context, I was 15 when this happened, most of my friends were the same age. When we did get there it was rather cliché. There was fog, it was rather dark and there was a light drizzle of rain. We went to the main gate which was padlocked shut. We decided to help each other hop over it and made a ton of noise. 
We were laughing and giggling the whole time, unsuspecting of what was to come. We looked around the small play place slash park with flashlights we had on our person. Even with our somewhat powerful flashlights our visibility was rather limited. We decided to enter the decaying building. Glass and dirt crunched under our feet as we stepped into the daycare section of the complex. There were still old Legos, with chips from previous furniture, old torn dolls and toys strewn about. The further we walked around the daycare section, we naturally became more and more silent, until all we could hear was the crunch of the dirt under our feet. I found some crayons in a plastic container in the corner of the room. I walked over to pick them up, when all of a sudden we heard a loud crash coming from behind a metal door leading to the psych ward part of the building. My friends and I all looked at each other. As a whole, we were a group of five, most of them were very bold and cocky. We all looked at each other when my friend, Brian, suggested we go and look to see where the sound came from. Personally I was not too fond of the idea, but with my group of friends there was no way anyone was going to decline such a thing. We all stacked up on the door and opened it. It was rusted to the floor and we had to get it open. As we walked in, the metallic smells became stronger, with a hint of something else which I couldn't put my finger on at that moment. We walked in, our flashlights pointed in every direction with Brian leading the group. The hallways were tight and to the left and right were the occasional metal doorway, some with doors open. I felt slightly claustrophobic and it felt a little hard to breathe. As we continued, Brian shone his flashlight into a room and recoiled. We all stopped walking as Brian slowly entered the room. What is it? I asked him. I thought I saw someone here. It seems all fine now. To be honest, I thought he was just messing with us to increase our anxiety. But looking back I think he was completely honest. He backed out of the room and we continued walking deeper into the psych ward, when another friend swiftly told us to stop. We came to a halt and all listened. In the distance ahead of us we heard the subtle pitter-patter of footsteps echo through the hallway. We all looked at each other, fear in each of our eyes. Brian continued walking toward the sounds, we considered turning back for a second without Brian, wondering if some ghost or something was in the building. But we couldn't do that to him. The closer we got the more I felt like I was being watched. When finally we entered a room on the right which had the smell of rotting meat. In front of us was a dead deer. Its innards were spilled all over the floor staining the concrete. A friend of mine had a very weak stomach and vomited all over the floor. That's when we heard whispering from somewhere. Brian shone his flashlight to the corner of the room where a man with short hair was standing with his head down. He wore a bright green t-shirt stained with what I assume was blood and torn beige pants. He did not have any socks and his feet seemed damaged. He was twitching sporadically and continued to mumble even after we saw him. We stared at him for a solid 30 seconds before he made his first true movement. He looked up at us with a haunting grin that sent shivers down our spine. You guys here for the feast, he said each word with varying inflection and energy. This kicked us over the edge and we bolted out of that room all the way back to the daycare center. The door was still open and we decided to try and slam it shut, but the rust and pure weight of the door almost kept it open. It took three of us pulling with all of our strength to close it. And just before we did I could still see the silhouette of the man watching us, his white teeth being the only other human feature I could see. As we sat behind the metal door catching our breath for a second all looking at each for confirmation that we all saw the same thing. After a little bit of labored breathing from each of us, we heard a light tapping on the door. That's when we decided that it was time to leave. We booked it out of the vicinity completely and ran home. A year after we visited that spot police went back to do a routine search of the area and found the man. It was stated that this guy used to go to the psych ward before it closed down. He escaped the facility he was transferred to and lived off of the wildlife around the complex. When the cops brought him in, he had a series of diseases and sickness from eating raw meat. His mental condition was much worse than before. There were future rumors that he did kill someone in the forest while searching for food, but nothing has been confirmed. In the end guys, be careful especially in dangerous areas such as abandoned buildings. And creepy dude, let's not meet. Alright, this happened to me about three years ago. It was brought up recently with my friends and they suggested that I post it here. I have gone through therapy for this and trained in firearms because this was the creepiest night of my life. I spent a night in what felt like a horror movie and it's still so vivid. It was a Wednesday night in the summer. I was off work. My husband was out of town, and our son was staying at his grandma's for the night. I was home alone with my dogs, an 80-pound Aussie mix and my 80-pound German Shepherd slash Pitbull mix. I always have issues sleeping when I'm home alone, so I tend to just binge watch TV in the living room until I can't keep my eyes open anymore. 
This particular night, I remembered that the trash pickup comes the next day. I decided to turn on Game of Thrones for a bit, then I would take the trash out. All of a sudden, I realize it's 1.30 a.m. and I still haven't taken the trash to the curb. My house has two solid iron gates, one in the front and one to the side door slash backyard. Lighting on our street, or anywhere in our neighborhood, isn't that great, but it's a quiet neighborhood with a lot of families and you rarely hear about crime here. I looked out the window by habit before I took the trash out and saw who I thought was my neighbor, smoking a cigarette outside of his gate across the street, looking directly at me. For context, this is a normal occurrence. My neighbor across the street hides his cigarette from his wife, so he typically does it late at night in front of his gate. I get off of work late, so I usually see him and we wave, say hi, chat a little. Then I go inside and he makes the joke, you didn't see me smoking if my wife asks. So unbothered by seeing the guy, I go outside, grab my trash cans, open my squeaky iron gate and take them out to the curb. I did not have my glasses on at the time, so as usual I waved and said hello. However the guy, who I thought was my neighbor, threw down the cigarette and quickly walked off down the street. It took a minute for me to register that he was not my neighbor. I was a little creeped out because he was clearly staring into my window from the opposite sidewalk. But also maybe it was a guy taking a night walk, not unusual in our neighborhood, and just stopped for a cigarette. I thought I probably weirded him out as much as he weirded me out, went back inside and laid on the couch with my dogs to keep watching Game of Thrones. At some point, I fell asleep and I woke up hearing my gate squeak and my German Shepherd mix growling. He's extremely protective of our family at home but he's also the kind of dog you can take anywhere because he's so friendly in public. My Aussie mix is more passive but his sheer size and scary bark tends to deter people. He's very friendly though. I quickly got up and pulled back my curtain. My gate was still shut and I didn't see anything. My dog however continued to growl at my front door. I looked out another window, which had a better view of my front yard and porch. I didn't see anything. Eventually my dog settled back down with my other dog, but I was still uneasy. I ended up watching TV again because I couldn't go back to sleep. About an hour later, I definitely heard my gate squeak. We are the only ones with the heavy cast iron gate and the noise it makes is so distinct. So I look out the curtain, while my dogs are continuing to softly growl. My gate is halfway open but I don't see anyone. At this point, I'm panicking. In my panic I couldn't find my phone. I grabbed my wooden baseball bat out of our room, crouched down, and started going through the couch cushions to get my phone. My dogs are oddly still quietly growling instead of barking, so I assume no one was there. The minute I find my phone, my front door handle starts shaking. I ran to the side door to let my German Shepherd mix out. I know he'll protect me and he can jump the six foot back gate. My Aussie mix, going crazy, busts out one of our door citadelines. I heard the guy say, oh shit, and immediately, I let out my GSD mix. I jumped up to look out the window, so my dog latched on the guy's hand. The guy starts screaming and takes off down the street, my dog chasing him. I then become terrified he'll hurt my dog. So I ran out with my baseball bat, screaming my dog's name over and over. The next thing I know, my dog is prancing down the street back to me, happy as shit with blood all over his face. I called the police, they took another hour or so to show up and didn't seem to take me too seriously. They said they'd call local hospitals, but I never heard back. I called my husband bawling and he got on the next flight home. I stayed with his mom for a few days, too terrified to go home. I did buy my dog's giant ribeyes for being so good and saving me. I don't know what that guy wanted but since then I've been trained in firearms and self-defense. So creepy guy. Let's not meet because my dog might finish the job he started. My story takes place two years ago, between the two first containment in France. I was home alone in my small apartment, working on something from my internship that I was freaking stressed about. It was the beginning of the afternoon, 14 p.m. I think. Someone knocked on my door, but I wasn't expecting anyone. I went to open up, and it was a guy I knew, let's call him Jim. Jim and I had slept together a few times a few weeks before, until he pushed me away without explanation. We were still friends, but I was a little hurt. Was I that bad? Had he gotten what he wanted and wasn't interested anymore? I didn't dare ask the question because I was getting a little attached, and I preferred to wait for it to pass, especially since we were bound to run into each other again. Indeed, Jim had recently got a room in the flat of a friend of mine. The situation was quite funny because he had stumbled upon the ad without knowing that I knew the other tenants, and my friend didn't know yet that I knew the new roommate. 
I was going to tell her about it in person when we meet again in college for our midterms. So I knew I was going to see Jim again, but I didn't expect to run into him so soon after he moved in, let alone during a surprise visit from him to my apartment. I asked him what he was doing there, he said he was bored at the dorm and was just passing through. I invited him in. I was a bit uncomfortable because I still liked him and we had left without any explanation about his rejection before he moved in with my friend. We talked for a while about trivial things, but strangely enough I still remember the main points. Then he wanted to show me a new kind of massage against my stress that he had seen on TikTok. I hesitated a bit as I was still uncomfortable. Do you trust me? He asked. Yes. I sat on the floor and he touched my back for a while, then ditto once I was lying down. I don't remember everything except that at one point his arm was around my neck, and I thought, I'm not sure I can breathe. And then, blackout. Of course the memory of choking didn't come back right away, it took several months, but I'm trying to tell you the story in chronological order. When I came to, it was dark. I was still on the ground, bleeding. I don't remember if I noticed the injury right away, but I had a large hole in my right side, with many cuts underneath. The events are pretty fuzzy in my memory. I wondered where Jim had gone and why I was alone. I went to look in the hallway, but my keys, which are normally always in the lock, were missing. I found the spare and looked outside. No one was there. Then I had my first stupid reflex. I thought, I'm hurt. I need to disinfect and started to take a shower. I think I fell asleep and had nightmares of being tortured and kidnapped in the shower, probably a way for my brain to try to warn me that something bad was happening. I then looked for my phone, which was also missing from the apartment. I was confused, probably drugged I realized later, so I decided to go to bed to resume the search after resting. I told myself, if I'm still hurt when I wake up, it must be real. It seemed very logical in my mind at that moment. When I woke up, my mind was already a little clearer, but I was still not totally myself. It was 20.21 PM I think, I was still bleeding. I looked for my phone again, and I started to panic as I couldn't find it. I tried to calm down. I told myself that it was probably there somewhere, I just had to ask someone to call me. I contacted my best friend, let's call him Tom, via messenger through my computer. I still had a hard time unlocking my computer, I couldn't type my code. I think I was still drugged. Luckily, Tom was online. He tried to call me on my phone, but no ringing could be heard in the apartment. I think he figured out that I wasn't in my right mind, because he called me on messenger to see if I was okay. It was he who gave me the details of our conversation, I have almost no memory of it. I said, if you think you've been hurt, do you call the fire department or the police first? He freaked out, and asked me to explain what was going on. I was very confused but I think he got the gist of it. He asked, did Jim do this to you? I don't know, maybe. I was still in denial at that point. Tom called the police on me. He couldn't come to help me because he was studying in another city. As I waited for the cops to arrive. I began to realize that I had completely messed up the crime scene by touching everything looking for my phone, not to mention the shower and the nap, which could have killed me in retrospect. I was still in no pain though, the hole in my side started to hurt when I was taken care of by the paramedics that the cops called when they saw the extent of my injuries. I had to undergo surgery as a result of this assault, which took me months to accept as an attempted murder with a knife. I had a hole in my liver, a pneumothorax, and was bleeding a lot luckily my other organs were not affected. While I was in the hospital, the cops came to take my statement and took Jim into custody. Imagine the surprise of my friend and her roommates when they found out that the new roommate not only knew me but was also accused of assaulting and robbing me. One week after the assault, when I got out of the hospital, the first bad news was that the cops had not been able to retrieve the recordings from the surveillance cameras in my building, which had already been erased because the procedures had been too long. The next day, the policewoman in charge of the investigation told me that, of course, Jim denied having been at my place that day, and nobody was at the flat to confirm if he was indeed at home all day. That's it for now, go home to your parents and get some therapy. Great. Big up to my psychologist who is an incredible person and helped me a lot. And then I waited. For a long time. I had to have the seals from my building analyzed for Jim's DNA. Without video or witnesses, it was the only way to prove that he was my attacker or at least that he was in my apartment that day. It took a year and a half to get the prosecutor's verdict, no further action. No identifiable DNA other than mine had been found at the crime scene, I probably destroyed everything with the shower. So there you have it, we can't pursue the investigation, I could never prove it was Jim. I don't have any memory of the assault itself, 
I don't think I'll ever find them, but I have no doubt that Jim did this to me. I think if I ran into him, I would freeze like a rabbit in front of a car. Today, I am much better, but I still suffer from PTSD. For a while, I couldn't drink alcohol because the drunken feeling reminded me of when I was going to be unconscious. Now I only panic when I'm with someone and have trouble breathing. I can't pull the blanket over my face if I'm in bed with my boyfriend, for example. And most of all, it makes me sick to know that Jim is free to live his life and to hurt someone else.